<laughs> we also have some folks from uh, Texas and Sierra who will also follow tonight. Uh, we're going to get the next one um, hi, I'm Marley from Texas Stones. We're one of the larger staffing and um, maintenance services companies here in Nashville. Uh, really a unique line, but I focus primarily in the development space for our market. And um, we'd love to, to connect and tell you what's going on in Nashville. And you can come to and I are thinking I'll, I'll be here afterwards if you, if you want to just come and play. Hey. So just wanted to say thanks for letting us host tonight and, and bring some feedback. So, Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody, give it up one more time for Emma and Texas and support. Uh, awesome. So I'm probably going to forget at least two people. Uh, but tonight we're going to have some really great talks. Uh, first up is going to be Andrew Butler. We're going to do a talk on angular and material design. Yeah, right. Awesome. Uh, Second was Kevin Old, right? With the new one, yes. Yeah, you're checking out, thanks. Uh, third was going to be Brad, sorry, Brad, 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 React. Uh, tips. Fourth was Scott. Scott. How can I forget Scott? Yes. Uh, you're not saying that. It's, it's like the title's like this long. I mean, it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's it's tooltips uh, using foreign noise selections. Tooltips using foreign noise selections. And, and we also have uh, Jason Moore, who's back in the corner, going to do a talk on computer chess algorithms and functions. So without further ado, we're going to bring Andrew and get started. Hold on a second. Uh, I've got some freshly minted uh, Nash VS stickers if you're interested. Uh, I'll look back there by the whiskey bee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Rodney for giving us this big one. Anyways, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Now for his next trick, follow me on the mic. Some of the dark goth tech doom music. I know. Or black metal from the uh, So you just go here, and then enter screens. I might have to do after it's plugged in, but. I'll ask. Because it'll have to be on another display. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is this the feed chat? Feed that. Oh, is it me? <laughs> yeah, we're gonna hang out and keep mic. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah. And for the last time, um, my name is Drew Butler. I'm a software engineer at Vanderbilt. Uh, I work mainly on the um, patient facing uh, client side, uh, mainly at VanderbiltHealth.com. I also work on some of the internal. Uh, the internal um, websites at Vanderbilt, at the, specifically at the Medical Center. And there you can see where my GitHub is and uh, my Twitter. So what I want to talk to you, I want to talk to you about four things really quickly. And it's going to be a very brief overview of those four things. Yeah. Can you share your screen? It's not sharing. No. It's your it Sorry. That's good. Right there. Oh, yeah. There. And just I'll hover over here and do the green one right there. It's a dark screen. Yep, we're good. Are we good? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so I want to talk about four things really fast. I want to talk about material design and basically what it is. I want to talk about integration with Angular JS. Uh, I also want to talk about how to implement it and some things to watch out for. So at Vanderbilt, we're actually redesigning our pretty much our main website, which is VanderbiltHealth.com. We're in the midst of that redesign right now. And in that redesign, we're going to add some elements of Angular. And we're thinking about, OK, how do we do sort of front-end development for this little thing that's going to be built in Angular? So we thought about, well, what about material design? So this is what Google says material design is. It's the creation of a visual language that synthesizes classic principles of good design with innovation and possibility of technology and science. Anyone know what that is? Anyone know what that means? Cool. That's fine. Anyone know what that quote means? Yeah, I don't either. I don't have the first clue. This is a little bit better explanation about what, what material design is. It, it develops a single underlying system that allows for unification of experience across platforms and device sizes. That's a little bit better. So I was telling that to someone, and they told me, well, wait. That's Google version of Bootstrap, right? I was like, well, not exactly. Um, well, it, material design can make your website app responsive with some default looks and feels for your pages. And they were like, well, so yeah, it's exactly like Bootstrap, right? And I was like, well, kind of, sort of. Because if you look at this, what Google, sort of what um, Google's doing now, if you have an Android app, if you have a Gmail app, it kind of implements versions of Google Design, of material design, or if you have Google Maps. It has elements of what Google th Google's overall philosophy about what that app ought to look like, where things ought to be, how, what users ought to experience when they interact with your web app. That's sort of behind the scenes of what, what material design is. So the people at Angular, that, you know, you know what, why don't we implement this and sort of integrate it with Angular? So material design will sort of become the user experience, user interaction part of, in, of, of Angular. Right? So, but you can not, so, so it will like design a web page. You can, like, use elements of it so, so, so it will look, very good to a user. So like this is their inbox back page. So like Bootstrap, Material Design uses um, uses um, uses ways to sort of display layout. Uh, instead of using uh, display inline, display block, uh, it uses flexbox, uh, display flex. Um, so high integrated with uh, Angular, Angular JS. Well, both made by Google, so the integration is pretty simple. Um, 
the basic the basic docs for material design you can find it at uh, material.angularjs.org so the basic idea was to intertake everything that people really like about um, about AngularJS, uh, dependency injection, services, modules, data binding, uh, standard directives, animations, and sort of port it into Angular material design with user, user, user interface components, uh, user experience effects, support for accessibility, flexbox, and themes. So, so that's sort of what the idea is. Now, all this is still in beta. I think it's 0 0.9.0. Um, so it's something that's still really being worked on. But this is sort of the main idea. So they take layout, CSS, combined with user experience components, combined with themes to create Angular design. Now, there are two things to keep in mind. This is only applies to Angular projects that are 1.3 or later. There are some people who are private, are, have Angular projects that are earlier than this, 1.1, 1.2. And unfortunately, uh, material design, how, Google's, how Google and how the Angular team sees it, isn't really going to work for, for, for you and for your project. Also, it's going to be an issue with people who have to support earlier versions of IE, like IE8. Are there any unfortunate souls who have to support IE8? And I'm the yeah, two. Awesome. All three. Beautiful. Yeah, so you, you know my pain. Yeah, so it's not fun. So this also won't support IE8, and it will never support IE8. It also won't support IE9, which are also things that uh, we have to either work around or choose to use it or not to use it. Let's talk about how to implement it. It's pretty easy how to implement it. If you use Bower, uh, you can use Bower install and go to material. Or if you don't want to use Bower, you can do all this. Um, so your choice. By the way, that's using a CSS that you have to use. You have to also have Angular. Uh, Angular dash animate, Angular slash aria, and then Angular material .js. So one or the other, and you would basically just like any other app, you would um, you would create a name for it, like a food app, and then you would you would call it just like any other, you know, just like anything else you would. You just call it ng material, which is the actual name for it. So let's say you have something like this. You just have a div with like a name, an age, and a sport. So on the page, it will look a lot like this. So if you just add this attribute, layout equals row, it will look like this. Now I remind you, there's no like CSS, there's no tricks. That's the only attribute you have to add. So let's take it one step further. If I add flex, to each of the divs, the name div, the age div, and the sport div, it'll lay things out on the same row through equal spaces. Now, there's no other CSS type of things that you have to do to do this. You just need to add those attributes. So this is an app that I've basically created um, really quickly. Uh, there's a link to that at the end of the presentation if you want to take a look at it. It uses Angular and Material Design. You can see it's responsive. You can see there's all kinds of really nice share buttons. And uh, you can make, make a nice little list. You can press it. It moves. It's really active. And, and here's all the principles that really Google envisions users uh, have when they interact with your web app. So how to do that? Remember like the list of users I had on the one side? This is basically how I did that. I gave it a div, I gave it a div layout equals row. I gave it a side map, which is MD equals side map, MD equals of course material design. Um, so gave it call so create a side map, 
Um, they give it a column layout, so it'll go down the page. MD list, which is basically create a list. MD item or items within that list, and populate that list with the users on my page. That's pretty much all I did to create it. Now, to create the content side, which is with the other side of the users, instead of MD sidebar or side nav, it would be MD dash content. And that's, yeah, that's it. There are a couple of button things like MD buttons, MD icons, but for the balance of the project, that's pretty much all I had to do to put up a pretty decent app using material design. Um, so a couple things to watch out for. First off, it's still in beta, like I said before. So uh, there's also no legacy support. However, there is actually a CSS-based version of uh, material design that Google is actually working on that may be announced, possibly, at Google I.O. I did not just tell you that. Um, uh, it's not really recommended. Also, material design isn't really recommended for uh, production projects quite yet. But if you want to just play with it while it's still in beta, feel free. So to review, I told you a little bit about material design, a little bit about how it integrates with AngularJS, how to implement it, and some things to watch out for. Uh, if you want to know a little, more, a little bit more about it, you want to go to this GitHub page. You can find it at github.com slash angular slash material. Um, if you want to see the slides or if you want to see the sample app I produced, uh, I'll post the link up on my Twitter, uh, Twitter score Butler, or you can go to bit.ly md slash recipes for the sample project and md slash js for the slides. Awesome. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Is it good? All right. Hi, so my name is Kevin. Um, I'm going to talk about Immutable JS. Um, how many people have heard of Immutable JS? Okay. How many people are using Immutable JS? It's changed his life. Anybody else? <laughs> no, really. Like that third point. It will change your life. So um, uh, Mutable is put out by Facebook, um, and it literally allows persistent data that's immutable. That's it. And it's really, really simple, but it's a huge concept that is coming from the functional world that we don't have a JavaScript. Uh, when I got wind of Immutable JS and, and Mori, uh, if you guys have heard of Mori, that was put out by David Nolan, um, and it just occurred to me, holy cow, we have the DOM and we have a JSON object in there and anything anywhere can mutate that. Okay, that's extremely terrifying if you have any kind of application, but especially one that I was working on with financial data. So I have expense reports, things like that. I don't want anything changing that but my code. Um, I want to lock that object up really, really quickly. So immutability, uh, immutable JS gives me that ability. Uh, it's a library, so it's, it can be integrated very quickly with anything. Um, and once you make a, uh, a structure, you, you can't change it. It's that simple. I mean, it's, it sounds really, really difficult, but it's not. Um, 
I'm not talking about the uh, the guts of it. There's a talk in the pre uh, at the bottom of this gist, which I'll tweet out after this, um, and NASJS will retweet it. Um, but Lee Byron, the, the guy that wrote this at Facebook, he talks about the, the tree data structure uh, and the history behind that. But these concepts come from the 50s, uh, and um, that whole talk will blow your mind. I've watched it five, six times. It's still amazing. Um, immutable data will change your life. It will change the way you think about programming. You're not looking at a structure and thinking that you're manipulating that object. You expect to return another object, and then you can compare that. You can put it on a, a, a array for history, immediately recalling history. Um, it really will change your life. So this is all you have to do to get started. Uh, you can npm install immutable, um, and then this is common JS syntax, but you can require it uh, in, in your page as well. Um, so we're simply creating some stooges, and we we use a, a very familiar syntax. So they have very familiar uh, ways of, of letting you work with your data, uh, and where we try to set uh, a, a new stooges. Number two, we're trying to change Curly to Kevin, but this only returns objects. So what it will do is it will return a completely new structure, and um, Stooges stayed the same, and New Stooges was obviously changed. The cool thing about this is it uses linked lists, and one and three are essentially just pointers in the second data structure. So New Stooges are in one, and there's a pointer to one and a pointer to three. So it's very efficient in how it does it. So um, you can, so if you arrive at some object, you're going to want to know, if you're playing with immutable stuff, and you may have some time where you want to, you have other JSON objects that aren't immutable, you may want to check and see if something is immutable. They have a very, uh, a nice little convenience method to let you know if it's uh, immutable, or immutable or not. Um, they implement these structures. Um, I will talk about it in a minute, but I only use map and list so far, so uh, a list maps to an array, a map uh, maps to a hash. You can use an order map that ensures the order of your um, uh, the, the items in there. Um, the reason I only use those two is because I use uh, from JS. So whenever I get data from the server, uh, I have a, a, an app that loads a set of expense reports, and I get an initial dump of data from the server about those expense reports. I run them through from JS, and that will convert all of your data, that JSON structure, into the proper nested uh, structure, right? So it, it will, it gives me a list, and inside that I have a list of, like, expense lines, and then inside that is an object, which is a map. So, um, so far I haven't used anything else, and I've been using it for about uh, uh, four or five months. Um, if you want to get data out, they have other, you can explicitly say you want an object or an array or something, but... To JS, this is exactly how you have an immutable structure, and then you get JSON back out of it. There are times when you may need that if you're logging, you know, console log, something like that. Um, so uh, nesting is, is, you know, you've got these big structures, uh, and um, here I, I literally bring in some reports and I make them immutable, and then I can get the first report. So there's getters and setters. Um, those return new objects, so you're not, it, it's not, it's an immutable object at that point. Um, I can check if it's invalid, uh, validate if it's an immutable object, uh, which that is true. And then um, here, here's an example. This is some, pulled from some live code that I have uh, in some expense reports. Um, we call them artifacts, but they're attachments. So when you have an expense item, uh, line and you um, attach a receipt, we call it an artifact. And it's it's nested in this expense artifact structure. Um, I go, there's a get in, and that's the way you can traverse, you give it a path uh, to um, item one, or I'm sorry, index one, the expense line structure, uh, uh, or key, index zero, and then I want expense artifacts. So it will return me that object um, as an immutable object. I can then um, update that, so it's got, the unshift here is, um, is a uh, is a part of um, mutable to have all the convenience methods that you're used to and underscore or low dash um, that will allow you to iterate over something. Uh, essentially, under the covers, um, 
uh, immutable is uh, it implements iterable, which is uh, like the core of all of those structures. Um, this is fascinating reading for later on. Um, but you can simply put something on top of the, the array of artifacts, and then I, 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 there's a setting to where I walk that, that path again, and I say, here's the updated artifact. So that's an array up here going down to where I want to set it. Put it in place here, and then I set that to new lines, which is my uh, global structure that, that keeps up with that stuff. That's really all you have to do is change data, and at any point in time, say that the, the business side came to us and said, you know what, we need to put undo in there. Well, if this before I modify new lines, I could simply have a history array that I push that structure onto before I, I reassign the mutated part. And then I, I use this in a React app, so at that point I could just pop it out and then send it down the, the tree as a property, and it would I've got instant undo. Um, there's a lot of other, it just, I don't know, it's phenomenal. Uh, there's some gotchas when you're looking at um, immutable JS. Uh, I meant to put a screenshot of the tweet, but a week or two ago I tweeted uh, zero days since I have been duped by TypeScript. Um, Immutable is written in TypeScript, and even though the extensions on the file say .ts, um, when you look at it, you're, it looks so much like ES6, you're just going to be like, oh, wow, this is ES6. And then it's like, why are they doing these angle bracket things? That's TypeScript, so watch out for that. Um, the docs are in TypeScript as well. Um, the links are here to the, the project, to the docs itself. Here's the talk I mentioned. I highly recommend watching this three or four times. Um, there's a lot of stuff that will blow your mind, and I was just going to show off the docs uh, and, and what is um, what will trip you up with uh, TypeScript-wise. Uh, when you go to look at a certain um, you know, item, the bracket thing, that's, that's um, TypeScript syntax. So just beware. Um, if you have any questions, um, hit me up on Twitter, um, at Kevin Old. Thank you very much.
Are you going to unmute that one? Yeah. Okay. Let me mute mine then. All right. Okay. All right. So back to the fun. All right. So I am primarily an Angular developer. Um, I, I love JavaScript in general, Go in general, but um, Angular is where I spend most of my time. And so a few weeks back, literally about five weeks ago, I thought, hey, I'm hearing a lot of stuff about this React thing. I'd like to just look at it and see what some of the things are. Um, and just, just see you know, how, what the paradigm is. How does it compare to some of the paradigms and other things that I've worked with? And so I'd like to talk about React mixins. I think, um, I think there's a couple of things about React mixins. And um, I've used them to just solve a really simple problem that we're going to go through, just a real world problem, very simple. And um, I, think, I, ho I hope that you all will enjoy it. So the issue is that we've got a problem. Your client calls and says, help. I have a potential for dynamically changing form fields. They can be added and removed based on other form fields. And I need for my form component to know whether or not it can submit. So this is a problem that if you've been doing web development very long, you've probably faced it. You've probably solved it in 15 different libraries or homegrown things or whatever. Um, and so PS, it must work in all browsers, be beautiful, easy to use, and done ASAP. So that's the, that's the problem. So, I've used a, uh, a technique before where you have a kind of com container component or a parent component, and that as components enter or exit, they register or deregister, unregister, whichever. And so um, if we think about this, and we, we think about the React paradigm of everything being a component, we can look and we see that we have a few components here. We have a, a form that controls the submit button because it knows its state as far as whether it should go to submit or not. And there should be like a black box in here, a container that components should go into. They should be able to register. And then if they need to exit, they should remove that registration. And so what we're going to see is a text input going in. It registers as, hey, I'm now part of you. I'm registering myself. And I'm going to give you a couple pieces of access to know whether or not I'm valid, what my value is, stuff like that. And so we have another type of input field. And it's going to deregister when it leaves. It's going to say, hey. I'm gone. You no longer need me. But I don't want to have to write this registration mechanism four different times or five different times on all the different field type components that I'm going to build. So that's where mixins are going to come in. And so a mixin is a way for totally separate components to have common functionality. And they still remain totally separated even after the mixing is done. The reason that I bring that up is because um, we've probably all worked in applications where you use like extend, underscore extend, jQuery extend, backbone extend, whatever. And so if you've ever seen an application where somebody takes an object and then extends it and then extends it and then down here extends it and then down over here extends it, and it's got 300 methods, 5,000 properties, you have no idea where the heck any of it came from. And it's a lot of fun, right? So you're digging through the code, you're trying to find where the heck did they add this in. And it's beautiful. But with mixins, it's not quite like that. And I'll show you, I'll show you one of the things that I think they got really right with this. So we're going to look at an example of a mixin. We're going to have a, a module called at mixins. And it's going to have a registered form, form input mixin object. And it's just a plain JavaScript op object. Mixins should be like this. They should be lean. They should be very, very focused in what they do because they're going to be generic enough they can be shared among multiple items. So we have two functions. You need to be able to register. You need to be able to revoke that registration. Notice that inside of those functions, we can reference the this.props. React puts things that you pass into a component from an outer scope or, or a parent component on the properties object, on the props object. Whenever you do a mixin like this, the this keyword is going to automatically be bound to the scope of that component. And so that's pretty handy. However, well, if you notice what we're returning, we're saying this.props.register to form, and we're giving it an object. Here's my registration. right? So I've seen examples where people will pass data around and they'll just do this, like, oh, hey, here's me. But I feel like that that's an anti-pattern because you have a lot of access. Like, you can set state on the this. So what we're doing is we're creating a facade over the current object. We're saying, you're a form. All you need to know about me is my name, how to tell if I'm valid, and what my value is. You should not need anything more than that. All right, so now that we have our mixin, let's create our form component. React has a method called create class, and you pass in an object definition or description. Of, I've seen both words used. I like definition. It makes sense to me. So that's what I'll roll with. So app components, let's just say we have a module to hold all of our components. We're going to create a form component. We're going to pass in 
I didn't want to do all this in code. Um, these ones, I just want to type it up. Here's what we're going to pass, what we're, we're going to give it. It's going to have an inputs object, and it's just going to be a placeholder for all the register inputs. Register input method that takes an object, which is what you're mixing, is going to pass back, and it's going to basically just from the store, and then update validity. Every time a, an item comes in, a field comes in, and it registers or it exits and it revokes that registration, the form now has to reassess, am I valid or not? So we're going to look here. There's one more function uh, that's passing that object definition that I wanted to actually put out in code, and it's, it's very important. It's, it's a lifecycle event. With React, you have multiple lifecycle events. You have rendering, you have a component will mount, component will unmount, and multiple things. This is kind of the different, the different milestones along the way, and you can take advantage of these checkpoints, and you can do last minute modifications or, or things like that. So our form knows how it needs the registration. It knows how to register. It knows how to unregister, right? But our inputs are children elements. They don't know how to do this. So you have to teach the children. So React gives you a couple different helpers. You have react.children.map, and it's just a, an array.map, essentially. It just maps over the children returns uh, different objects. So it's essentially a data transformation function. This.props.children is where all of your children are going to go. So if you imagine for a minute that we have a form component and then arbitrarily put any inputs in there that you want, it will map over those inputs as the children, and it will create this added props object and say, here's how you register, here's how you revoke your registration, and here's a function I want you to call on validity change. And return react.clone element, you take the child element, you clone it with the additional props onto it. And here we are. So here's this arbitrary list of cloned children. The form is just an HTML form that it returns, right? Our, our form component returns an HTML form. And it also has, at, at the lower section, its own set of buttons. And you can easily use props on the form to say, here's where I want my submit button to say, here, I want a cancel button. You know, you can do whatever. So now that we have a form, we need inputs to go to that form. Given that this is a lightning talk, um, I decided to do a date picker. So kick back and relax. No, I'm kidding. I did a simple text input. And again, very, very simple pieces that go into this data um, or this class definition object. The part that feels important about mixins is that they're described right here. You don't have to go digging through all the code and say, what are the 50 different things that this takes a, takes a mix in of? Right? What are the 50 different things that blend together to add functionality to this component? They would all be listed here in this mixins array. So if you think, if you've ever done any like C sharp development and you have interfaces, you can kind of almost think about this like, okay, this implements these interfaces, except with interfaces, the concrete implementations are not defined. But with mixins, you define the concrete implementations of, of the methods and things that are going to go on the mixin. We have another uh, lifecycle event, component will mount. So when this input is going to mount, I need you to register back to your parent. Component will unmount, another lifecycle event. When this component's going to unmount, it needs to revoke that registration to let the parent container know, I am now gone. So putting together all the things. We have a demo app. We have, again, that class definition or description object. We have a simple method called onform submit. And so in our render function, this is how you tell React, again, what to render into the DOM. We're going to reference our app components.form, and we're going to pass it the on submit handler. We're going to pop in some labels and some app component.simple text inputs, and one of them is required. And those become the, the children that are referenced on this.props.children, everything within this form. So if you've worked with Angular and you're familiar with Transclusion, this is essentially their version of Transclusion. I actually think their version is a little easier to understand. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to look at a quick demo that I wrote. And so when the page is loaded up, you can see that I have two fields on this form. I have a name and a description field. I have an event log that says, hey, a name field was registered. A description field was registered. My form mounted, mounted into the DOM. My form is currently valid. If we remove the value from the name field, it was the only one that was required. Our name field 
fire an event to update the validity of the form, it says it's not currently valid. So you can see here the submit button is not enabled. If I change to our second set of inputs, you can see that the name field revoked its registration, the description field revoked its regist registration, and our three new fields register themselves, moniker, occupation, and job description. Our form is not currently valid. And so very quickly, we've just solved the problem that, that we had using a very, very clean set of mechanisms in React. And that is actually all that I have for today. Um, the slides are here, the demo's here. I'll also tweet out the link to the slides. There's my email, and I'm on Twitter at .NET Night. So uh, I appreciate you guys listening, and I hope that this was of some benefit. Thanks, Robbie. My name is William. I do technology for a living. Entire screen. You might have to do your screen first to work for some reason. Oh wait, what do I do? Actually, I have to plug your. Oh. Okay. There you go. For some reason, like one minute place change drops out. Looks good. So we're good. <coughs> okay. What? You're I believe so. Yes, you're good. Okay. Okay. Thanks. You're awesome. Is it not being shared? Um. It says I am. Okay. Do I click? Okay. Is it now shared? Okay, awesome. Okay, hi, my name is Scott Southworth. Um, I was going to talk about high performance tool tips um, and Voronoi selections, which Basically, uh, comes down to the fact that I do a lot of work with JavaScript and data visualization, and I started out working on a really large single-page app that had a lot of different visualizations and possibly thousands of different elements that I wanted to have little tooltips for, be able to pull up relevant data. And when we first started the project, the priority was to get it off the ground as fast as possible not necessarily to make it as performant as possible. So like a lot of people, I immediately was like, ah, uh, let's grab Bootstrap because, you know, it'll get you going. And things were going well for a while until I got more and more and more items that I had to represent. And I started running the Google Profiler in Chrome, and it turned out that the number one hit on my CPU was Bootstrap, um, primarily because its popovers just slug. And it even says so on their site. It's like, warning, you're going to have to explicitly opt into this because it will kill you. And I ignored that. But I, I needed it to have some kind of tool tipping system. Um, I didn't find one that I really cared for. And I wanted something that worked both with D3 out of the box, because D3.js is my primarily, primary uh, tool for visualizing data. And I wanted it to also play nicely with the rest of the DOM. Um, so I ended up writing basically a D3-based tooltip library of sorts that I put on the web um, with Kodama, which is off of the little Miyazaki tree spirits. Um, it, it's, it's, still, it's still kind of out there for now. Um, the <clears throat> Let's see. It's... Um, Sorry, I'm blanking. 
Um, so, um, give me one sec. I had notes. Ta -ta -ta. Okay. Um, so the things that were most important to me were just going around and getting something that had things like auto positioning in a tooltip, so that when you moved it around, you know, it would just automatically avoid you know, running off the screen for you, and to make it so that it would reuse like a single node on the DOM and resize off of that so that it would maintain kind of consistency and position and shape and be performant. Um, so I have, if you saw, you would have seen it if you were here for my talk before on frameworks, but this right here is just a bunch of bubbles uh, auto-generated randomly in D3. And so the way this works is we're just, you know, on mouse over, and I've got a little toolchip there that just says what the uh, value of the randomly generated bubbles hue and radius is. And I think it's got like 300 or so of those on there right now. And one of the things is, though, when you've got something like this, where you have something that's really data dense, you have to have some way of, you know, figuring out what item you want to select. And, you know, for some of these, you might have, like, a small item that's going to be, you know, in terms of mouse over detection, maybe obscured by the items next to it. And so there's no decent way to actually select it. And so... Two of the techniques I've found that are really kind of helpful for dealing with that are one, you can use, um, you can kind of slightly reposition elements um, using collision style algorithms where they just kind of force themselves apart. Um, another thing that I'll use in tandem with that though are what are called Voronoi selections, where, which is where you can basically, in D3 has a really nice, easy to use plugin for uh, doing this. You can basically just say, I want to create a Voronoi layout where it says, I've got zillions and zillions of these little bubbles or, or just points or vertices in space, and I'm going to partition space into a whole bunch of cells and with one of the vertices in each cell. So if you go to Wikipedia, you can read all about Voronoi diagrams and double triangulation and a whole bunch of math that you don't actually have to know to use this, but it's kind of fun anyway. Um, here's an example of what a uh, Voronoi diagram looks like. So you can see all the little dots. Each one has been given a cell, and in general, you can see that it pretty much connects any of the two points that are closest to each other, and then draws an orthogonal, a line orthogonal between them. And then, you know, as long as these points are the two closest, it continues the line. Um, so at this point, it switches to the other point. Um, so if you go back to this diagram, what it's doing now to be able to let you select a wide variety of these is I can click it, turn on the, uh, the Voronoi overlay, or it's right there. So normally this is invisible, but it's got the mouse overs are active on each cell. So you can see as I move from cell to cell, it, uh, it highlights the circles and gives you a, just a better way of breaking it up. Um, let's see. So let's see. the uh, last thing, this is on NPM if you want to just play around with it. And if you go to, I don't know if any of you have, I recently started using the GitHub pages, which are pretty cool. So the full code for that is on the GitHub site as well, um, if you just want to look at the D3 code. Um, I just wrote it at Crema a minute ago because I ran out of time earlier. So it's pretty rough. But also, I've set up a little cat bus site if anyone gets a chance and would like to mess around with cat bus, which is still under development. And I would love contributors for both of those projects if anyone's interested in helping out or messing around with them. And thank you very much.
Uh, and so, sorry, what? What is it? Entire screen or any given? Uh, let's give this a shot. Is there is there power? Plug in. Too far. Uh, Hi, everybody. I'm Jason Orndorf. Um, and my talk is about uh, uh, writing programs that play simple two-player games. And it is a not-so-lightning talk. Um, <clears throat> there's code in this talk, though. So that's good. It should be fun. Uh, before we get where we're going, um, I have to start out with a question that may sound a little weird. The question is, what is the shape of time? Well, time is a line. And we know this because there's a word in the English language for a kind of diagram. Timeline, right. <laughs> so um, if you know a little bit about like special relativity, or equivalently, if you've done any work with distributed systems, then you know that this isn't always exactly how time really is. The nature of time can actually get really, really strange. Uh, to say nothing of like Richard Feynman's interpretation of positrons as electrons that are going backwards in time, because this is something that <laughs> electrons do. Um, but don't worry, we're not going to get into any of the really, really weird stuff today. Instead, we'll turn our attention to a more basic problem with time, which is if the past is a line, what is the shape of the future? Now, the ancient Greek Stoics, this is a school of philosophy, they believed that the whole universe was totally deterministic. Everything that happens is caused by previous events in accordance with laws of nature and there's no wiggle room in those laws. So everything that happens is predetermined. So this is a stoic conception of a game of tic-tac-toe. Um, you can see, like, here's a snapshot of the game right at the beginning before the first move. And then somebody makes a move, and then it looks like this, right? And then the O player makes a move, and it looks like this. So you have Snapshot, move, snapshot, move, snapshot. And you can see it's a timeline. Now, history does not record whether the Stoics were actually any good at tic-tac-toe. But their deterministic view on time means that they're missing something that we're going to make use of to write a really good tic-tac-toe playing program. And that is the notion of decisions as selecting between multiple possible futures, the proverbial fork in the road. So this shape 
is what I've been getting at this whole time. It took longer than I thought it was going <clears> to. <throat> but let me show you what I mean. We'll just rewind to the very beginning of this uh, game of tic-tac-toe. Brand new game. All the mistakes are there waiting to be made, right? You can choose any one of these nine cells and put an X in it. And so there are these nine paths out in front of you. But I'm lazy, so I'm only going to draw three of them. There's three possible moves. There's three possible futures. So the shape of the future is this pitchfork shape, right? Only that's not the only choice in the game. As soon as you make your choice, then your opponent faces a decision. So whichever one of these futures you choose, it quickly branches out again. And after that, you get another choice. And I actually did draw all of them. No, not all of them, but as many as we fit on the screen. Um, so this is the shape of the future that I'm talking about. I like to call this the galactic time square this shape. It's a technical term. You may not have heard it. Some people call it a tree. Right? The uh, Argentinian poet Jorge Luis Borges uh, wrote a short story where he called this the uh, Garden of Branching Paths. So I chose tic-tac-toe uh, because, as crazy as this looks, it's actually one of the smallest games. Um, after nine moves, the game is over, right? So even though um, uh, I'm out to write a chess playing program, it's a lot easier to manage to think about tic-tac-toe, which has simpler rules, and has a tree which a computer can completely explore in a reasonable amount of time. The total fan out of the street tree is like 9 factorial, which I think is like somewhere in the 100,000s right, of possible games. And that means that there is an algorithm that will play tic-tac-toe perfectly. It's impossible to beat. You can tie it if you're smart and you don't get sleepy or something. So let's look at how this works. I'm just going to kind of illustrate how this algorithm goes. We've, uh, we've kind of zoomed way to the right to the very end of the time squid here, the, the, the last tentacles of it. Right here at the left, we have um, a game that's already in progress. Each player has had three turns. The battle lines are drawn. It's coming to a close. It's X's turn, right? We're X. We get to choose one of these three paths. There's only three spaces left on the board. Whichever one you choose, we're going to you know, zoom in on that future, right? Uh, and there's six different outcomes in all. Some of them O wins. Some of them X wins. An interesting thing about tic-tac-toe is if you actually get to the ninth turn, it doesn't involve any actual choices. There's only one place left to go. Right? So, again, six moves already made. This is move seven. Here, here, over here. Move eight. And move nine. So, given that we're looking at all possible futures, we have this kind of omniscient view of everything that could happen. How do we choose the best move for us? Now, maybe you can just see it. Um, and in fact, if I, if I didn't have all these confusing arrows and I just showed you the picture, you would definitely see it. Um, <clears throat> but we have to remember that computers are not good at this big picture, like, visual recognition stuff, right? The computer is, ha is like, incredibly myopic, right? So we have to come up with a strategy that works when you're looking at just one thing at a time, one small bit of data at a time. So, suppose, suppose we're going to approach this by giving each move a score, and we're just going to pick the move with the best score. We'll assign a move a plus one if it leads to victory, a minus one if it leads to defeat, and a zero if it leads to a tie. None of these are ties, but I tried to find a an interesting game state that would lead to wins, losses, and ties, but there's no, like, the game just isn't that deep. Um, so, 
so suppose the first thing, let's try and assign a score to this option, this move right here. It turns out to be easier to assign a score to all of the moves in the entire tree. So the first move that I'll really assign a score to is I'll actually look all the way to the end of this line. I'll see, oh, we win if we go this way. That sounds good, right? And I know that at least the last move here should have a score of 1, because we won. What this means for our opponent is, on the preceding move, when our opponent was faced with this grid, by moving there in that upper right-hand corner, they left the center blank for us, and so they lost. So what score should I assign to that move that our opponent made that led to us winning? It's a minus one for them. That's, uh, oops, oh, sorry, okay. I screwed up. This, I, I gave a plus one to every move that ends the game in victory. Seems like that's reasonable, right? Um, but our opponent's move that leads to us winning, that's a minus one for them. And I'll assign a minus one to all the others as well. If O makes a move that leads to X winning, that's a minus one. Okay. So now we're finally at a stage where we can answer the question, what, how good is this move? Is this good or bad for us? Should we move right here and make an X? Well, it depends. If we make that move, if we go this direction, we might win, we might lose. So what do you think? No? Bad move? Yes. Yes, yes it's a bad move, or is it yes, it's a good move? <laughs> yes, it's a bad move. Why? It's not the outcome where you went, no matter what your opponent's uh... Right. Yeah, you have to you have to kind of you need to select a move where you're certain to win, not a move where you might win. Because what's your opponent going to do? Well they're gonna pick the best move available to them, right? If we go this route, our opponent's going to choose instant victory. So we'll lose. And this is the way, this is like this is the insight. This is how this algorithm really works. What you do is, at each point, you're trying to evaluate a move. What you do is, look at what your opponent will do if you make that move. Look at their options. Assign a score to their options. Select the one that's best for them because that's what they'll do. And then flip the sign. If they're going to win with that plus one, the move is a minus one for you. Likewise, this middle choice, our opponent will choose this route. So this also is a minus one for us. The one at the bottom, our opponent has two losing moves. So whatever they choose, their best move is going to be a minus one, which is good for us. So how do we play? That's the one, right? OK. So let's implement this in JavaScript right now. Hmm, maybe that's a little bit big. Hang on a second. All right, um, so that algorithm, I already knew all that when I got started on this project. Uh, and let me just tell you a little background. Um, I go to a user group called Nash FP, National Functional Programmers. I highly recommend it. It's, it's a place to level up. Um, and it's also just like a super cash user group. <laughs> it's really nice there. Um, they uh, kind of, the, the, one, of the, one of the leaders of the group kind of puts a challenge to everybody, hey, write a program to play chess. So a couple of us did it. Um, and since I already knew this algorithm, I decided I'm going to implement that. The algorithm is called Negamax. You can look it up. N-E-G-A-M-A-X, Negamax. Because of the things that you do when you're doing the algorithm, you're like, you select the max score move, right? 
and then you negate that if it's your opponent's move that you're looking at, right? Um, yeah, so I, I knew all that. I knew that I was going to do that. But it still took me about a week to write the code. Um, a week of on and off, like, you know, an hour here, an hour there, trying to figure it out. And the reason is, like, just like everything in programming, if you can, if you can draw the lines and divide responsibilities in the right place, it's super easy. And until you figure out how to do that, it's just like nothing works and everything's terrible. <laughs> what I needed to do is draw the line between the part of my program that knows the rules of the game and the AI part. Once I figured out how to do that, I found out that the AI part is incredibly short. And in fact, it'll, all the code will fit on this one page. But in order to do that, I have to describe to you what the rest of the system looks like. What is the part that knows the rules? Well, it, it, uh, it's this one kind of object called a game object that knows all the rules of the game, right? A game object is a, is a, is a snapshot of the current state of play, right? Where are all the pieces? What's going on? And a game object has three methods that we're going to use. It has a moves method that returns what are the available moves, right? What 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 are your choices here? Um, I was gonna have like a game is over method uh, that just returns a boolean, but it turns out that like I didn't need that because what I'll do is I'll have game dot moves return an empty array if the game's over, right? It's kind of a short cheap shortcut on my part. Um, there's um, the game also has to tell you if the game is over, it has to be able to tell you who won. Right, so uh, I, I wrote something called game dot score finished game that just returns uh, this plus one minus one thing that we were talking about earlier. Right, that returns plus one if the last move that was made is a win. And then one more that I can't even remember. Uh, I have it written down. Oh, yeah, okay. So there also has to be, um, what else is in the rules of the game? Well, the game also has to be able to, like, tell us, if I choose this option, then what? Like, what does the game look like afterwards, right? So I had this apply move method. You call this method, right? You have a game and a move that you want to make. It's like the snapshot and then the arrow. And what it does is it returns a brand new game object that's, like, the, the picture on the other side of the arrow. Okay, this is it. These are these three methods that we're going to use. And given these three methods, we can build the whole algorithm in the next, I'm going to say three minutes. All right? Let's say five minutes. <laughs> I'm going to change this, and this is kind of an unmotivated change right now. You won't see why until later. I'm going to make this. Uh, instead of removing, instead of returning just the best move, I'm going to return it. I have it return both the move and the, the score of that move, and we'll see why in a little bit. So all I pass in is just the snapshot, right? And that snapshot is a game object, and it can tell me everything else I need to know based on moves and apply move. Um, so it can tell me, basically, everything I need to know to construct the whole squid from that point forward in the game. Uh, I'm going to write one more function here to help with this function called score move. And I want you to help me out. Tell me what the arguments to this function are going to be. What it's supposed to do is assign a score to a, to a move. So what do you think? <coughs> A game and a move. That's right. OK, cool. So yeah, so I, I have to tell this function where I am, right? And what my choice is that, I'm, that I want to evaluate. And it does the rest for me. And it returns a number. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any clue how to write either one of these functions? You can kind of see they're related. Anybody want to take a stab? Any ideas? So are you going to go fix that, or are you trying to redo the whole thing? It's tic-tac-toe. We'll just do the whole thing. Okay. 
All right. Here's what we'll do. Uh, let's do this one first. I want to know what is the score of this move. Well, the first thing I want to know then is what's the world going to look like after I make this move. So I'm going to have something called after, where we, you know we'll just apply the move and see what it looks like after that. Okay. So at this point, I'm, 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 I've, I've, uh, I can see what the what the game's going to look like afterwards. How can I assign a score to this move? Well, we figured out how to do that a couple minutes ago. What we need to do is find out what my opponent is going to do in reply. So I want to know what my opponent's replies are. What are, their, what are the possible replies? Yes, right. So I'm going to call best move and score to find out what my opponent is going to do. I'm going to use my own algorithm right, to see what my opponent's best move is. <clears throat> First, I need to check something, though. I just applied a move. I may have won. So I'm just going to check and see if the game is over. All right. So in this case, the game is over. In this case, the game continues. So what I'm going to do here is just what you said. I'm going to call best move and score uh, with some kind of arguments. And then we'll figure out what to do after that. Um, here, though, there's something really easy that I can do. I already said earlier that the game knows how to tell me who won. In fact, I, I made sure that it actually has a method called score finish game. Um, and so we'll just call that. So, after dot score finish game. I started typing this. I have to tell you, like, I made every bug it is possible to make when I was writing this code. <clears throat> And, and what's great about it is that it doesn't throw an exception. The computer is just really bad. <laughs> like, I, I had the computer playing chess in such a way that it was trying to lose all its pieces, <laughs> but not in an obvious way, because it was assuming that I was going to try not to take its pieces. So instead, it tried to corner me into taking its pieces. <clears throat> it's hard to debug that kind of thing, especially since, like, there's 30 million function calls going on. Anyway, um, great. So, uh, so we still have this blank spot, but we'll come back to it. Now let's go and write the other function, best move and score. So I'll show you what this is. This is going to return two values. Uh, it's going to return a best move and a best score. After? Oh, yeah, good idea. Thanks. OK. All right. So how do you actually return two values in JavaScript? What, you, what am I going to do? Object and return object. OK. I can do an array, but I'm going I'm to do an object. That's the first suggestion. That sounds good. So um, I'll, I'll return both the move and the score. Now all I have to do is actually compute them, right? Because this is a, the easy part. All right. Well, what can I do here? I've got a... Oops, sorry. Get all the moves. Get all the moves, yeah. Let's, let's start with that. Okay. And somebody suggested a loop. I think it sounds like a good idea. I'm going to say, OK, so, wow, I said this would all fit on the screen. <laughs> to save a little real estate, um, I'm going to use a, a method. This, does anyone know what this does, this for each method? This is actually built into JavaScript. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, I'm writing a function, and it's going to call this function for every move, right? It's going to call this function multiple times. It's going to pass me the move. It also passes me, like, an index and some other 
stuff, but I don't need any of that, so I'm just going to ignore it. All right, and this is, uh, so we're getting close, I think. What am I going to do with each move? Uh, sc score move contains that, so I think I just I need to I just need to score it. So I, I compute the okay my pass game right. That's the only game. Yeah, game and move right. Uh, okay, so compute the score of every move right, and then do what with it? Add it to sorry. Okay, all right, yeah, that's right. So I, I need to find out which one of these is the highest score. Um, so actually, let's do that. Let's do that right here, though. I want to know if this score is the best score I've seen so far. Ah, uh, cool, yeah, okay. Anything else? Ooh. I can't, can't get anything by you. All right, anything else? Uh, how about here? Equals what? <laughs> I can do you one better. All right, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, and in fact, I know like the first time through here, we are going to assign the best move. So let's just um, let's just assume that that nobody's going to call this if the game is already over. Uh, if that's the case, then we will always have moves, and so we'll all, we'll never return undefined here. We'll um, we'll always go through here at least once. Well, um, it looks like we're almost done. I didn't. Fit it on the screen. Oh, really close. Um, no, I'm, I'm stubborn. Uh, well, that's just gonna have to. This is gonna have to do. That's close enough. Oh, well, what about this? So, um, uh, what goes here? Sorry. After. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right, so there's a critical bug in here, and it's a bug I totally made first time I wrote this code, um, uh, and I've like very sneakily managed to hide it from you. Does anybody see it? It's actually on this line of code. Right. Yes. Right. This returns an object, right? And we want to know the best score. So we say dot score. Okay. One more major bug. <laughs> we want to get a score for this move. Is this a good move or a bad move? So what do we do? We apply that move. And we look at what our opponent is going to do and see if their score is good or bad. We got to flip it. That's right. So we need to put a minus sign here or somewhere here. That's it. So this is the this is the full source code. This is what I set out for. Um, now I I wrote I originally wrote this algorithm out for uh, for Nash FP, like I said, and in, hate to say it, but in Haskell this is five, well, five maybe seven lines of code. Um, uh, but what's cool about this is there's nothing in here about tic-tac-toe, right? This will work for any game where you can implement those three methods. So we'll uh, we'll see in a minute if I can uh, if I can show you this code running uh, playing a game that is not tic-tac-toe. And I'll point you at the repo that has this in it. Um, a little later. Uh, that isn't what I meant to do. Oh, here we go. Okay. okay. Uh, so when so um, 
my uh, graphic design skills are not, <laughs> not that great. Um, uh, well, let's see if I can if I can remember the command. I don't actually I don't actually use Mac OS very much, so I've completely forgotten the keyboard shortcuts, uh, which are just like slightly different. Here we go. Cool. And let's see if this works. I would like to make this bigger. There we go. All right. Uh, I wish you could see the bottom of the screen. Oh, good. You can see. You can see that, right? Can you see it? Um, okay. Slight problem. Should I try and debug this live? Sure. Oh, is that right? It, sorry. What? How? How much is shared? Um, okay, all right. I, I can. Okay, all right. I'll go back and. Uh, if you hi 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 hi, um, how do I change that? Anybody know? Yeah. Do I click here? Uh, yeah, click there. And then meta stop, and then do it again. Click, and then entire screen. Entire screen. Great. Okay. Um, okay. Can you see that now? Yes. No. Is that on another console? Another workspace? Oh yeah, it is. I can. I, but I can. I can change that. Hang on. Um, I think. Control what? I try command up. Hmm. How about that? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, all right. So this, yeah, this, like, I, again, I have a bug here because I didn't test this sufficiently. Um, so let's take a look and see. Um, ah, here we go. Don't try this at home, kids. Hashtag state. All right. Oh, look at that. Isn't this great? <laughs> no? <laughs> well, um, but this isn't the game I want to play. I want to play a game called Pennies. So my, um, my kids taught me this game. Pennies is an awesome game. You start out by throwing a bunch of pennies on the bed, and on your turn, you can take one, two, or three pennies. You take turns, and whoever takes the last penny wins. The pennies are worth nothing. Whoever takes the last one is the winner of the game. All right? So let's play. There are 14 pennies left. It's us versus a computer. How many should we take? We're going to do this by level of applause. How many people think we should take one? Two. Three. Yeah. Let's do it. We take three. Computer takes three. So it said there are 11 pennies left. Computer took its turn. There are eight pennies left after that. And it's our turn again. So there's eight pennies left. How many people think we should take one? Two, three, three again. All right, the computer responds instantly, getting overconfident. <laughs> there are four pennies left. Crap. <laughs> All right, so you've probably seen by now, no matter what we do, if we take one, the computer can take all the rest. If we take two or three, the computer can take all the rest. So I guess we, we might as well be a good sport and play it out. Three? Let's do three. Uh, there's zero pennies left. Game over. I win. 
I don't know why I program a computer to such a smart ass. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> oh, well, that was fun. Um, there is actually a way, by the way, you can win that game against the computer, this, unlike tic-tac-toe. Um, so if you check out the repo later on, give it a shot. See if you can figure out like how that how that game works. I want to show you. Uh, I, I'm not going to show a lot more code. We're, we're we're pretty much done. But I do want to show you the code for Pennies the game, because as short as the AI is, like actually a super super simple game has simple rules, and the implementation is actually really really short. Um, this is using uh, ES6 class syntax, which you can't use on the web unless you compile it. Um, but this is like this is what JavaScript is going to look like in one year, um, uh, and you should kind of be able to read between the lines and see what's going on. Basically, each one of these lines is a method. I wrote it really compressed so that it would fit. It's not you know you wouldn't normally write like you would write more like normal methods. You'd put some some line breaks in there. Uh, but basically, we said there were three methods on a game, right? Well, here they are. The moves method returns an array of moves. The possible moves are one, two, and three. But it's against the rules to take more pennies than the number of pennies that are actually left. So that's what the filter is about. Uh, score finished game is supposed to return one if the last move was a winning move. In pennies, the last move is always a winning move, so it returns one. Um, and apply move is the one where you pass it a move and it returns a brand new game object. So it returns a new pennies object. And it, what it does is it subtracts the number of pennies that you moved, right? So this is actually pretty simple. Um, Tic-tac-toe is more complicated. It would barely fit on the screen. And then chess actually is such a complicated, like needlessly complicated game. Um, well, like, when I... It's it's like you can't move into you can't move into check. Why? Just to annoy people writing chess programs. That's the only reason. <clears throat> um, yeah, the the actual the, the rules of chess are hundreds of lines of code, but the AI to play them is still very short. It's still just like you can you can write an AI that will do a well slightly incompetent job uh, playing against it in, in twenty lines of code. Um, OK, so this is where we were. We saw that. Great. OK. Uh, so that's, that's the main thing I want to show you today. But uh, just in case you came here wanting to hear about chess programs, I'll tell you a little bit about that, too. This algorithm has to be modified a little bit to play chess. Why? It's The moves are different? What I mean is like the plan scoring on the board is different. So here's the OK, so, so the, the moves are different. But again, like we wrote code that's very generic, right? Yeah, they can play. Four spaces of moves. That's true, but still. You can't search the, the move down the tree very far because the number of passes are just kind of uh, Right. So the, the answer, in case you're listening at home or you didn't hear that, is you can't explore the tree very far because the number of moves explodes. The number of possible game states increases so quickly that you'll run out of RAM. Right? Uh, you'll also run out of time. Um, yeah. Uh, so I found this factoid on the internet. I believe it. There are more games of chess than the number of atoms in the universe. Uh, in fact, if you just look ahead four moves, that is four of your moves and four of your opponent's replies, you're already looking at more possible game states than the number of stars in the galaxy. Right? It's in the tens or hundreds of billions. Uh, so, Remember, the algorithm we came up with really banks on the game ending at some point, right? Chess has rules where it ends eventually. There are a finite number of game states, but it doesn't end soon enough. There is no way we could possibly compute the whole tree. So what do we do? Well, at that point, you cheat. Um, 
Yeah, so you what you do is you, you search uh, a couple of moves ahead as far as you have time to search. And then when you reach a point where it's like, I gotta turn back because I gotta look at some other moves, you guess and you assign a score based on whatever the board looks like. You just kind of look at the board and say, ah, that's a, that's a 0 0.6. Right? So what, what factors into that? One is uh, material. So if you look at a board state, it's like, oh, I lost my queen. That's pretty bad, right? So you might give that one like a minus 0.6. It's not as bad as being checkmated, but still not good, right? Um, whereas if you come out just a pawn ahead, that'd be a plus 0.1. What else? Well, um, so I played with it a little bit, and I don't know what like actual good chess AIs use um, as kind of a good way to guess whether a board position is, is good or not. But what I did is I had it... Uh, Bump up the score a little bit if your pieces attack lots of squares, if your pieces attack enemy pieces, and if your pieces protect one another, uh, and particularly if your pawns are lined up so that they protect one another. Um, and that ended up making a program that was good enough to beat me, which isn't saying much. Uh, Let's let's uh, let's see it in practice. So another thing that I did while I was uh, doing all this is um, uh, I wrote my own chess AI, but I also um, I also found a super old one, older than me, um, written in the 70s for like the first 8-bit computer that Commodore built um, uh, before the Commodore 64. There was I forget the name of the thing. Um, I found a chess program written in assembly for that machine, and I ported it to a language that I could actually run. Um, and we're going to see it play. Oh, shoot. i got to stop this. Uh, OK, so what you're about to see um, is these two programs playing against each other. My program in, is going to be black. It's going to be at the top of the board. The ancient 1970s assembler program is playing white because it only plays white. Like, <laughs> um, uh, the actual chess board that you're going to see, the GUI, uh, it'll be instantly obvious that I didn't write that. It's way too nice. Um, that's actually a, a, it's called an XBoard, and it's free software. Um, and it's designed so that you can either play human versus computer two AI against each other. Um, it's, it's really, or you can play it uh, uh, as a kind of a gateway to a chess server on the internet. It's really neat. Um, very generic piece of software. Um, and you'll find that white moves instantly every time because it's a program written to run on 1970s hardware. It was supposed to take like five minutes per move. Um, and uh, occasionally, my program, the black program, is kind of stumped and thinks about it just a little bit. But the game will still go by a little too fast to, for me to really comment on it. Um, so I'll just say, things to look for, white is going to start to clobber me in the early game, and is going to totally blow it. All right? I'm about to blunder. That's a bad move. I'm going to be forced to trade queens because of that. And then he's going to eat my pawns. He's going to eat like two or two more pawns. Yeah, it, it looks like I'm doing well. Boom, boom. Yeah, and another one. Oh, uh, that's bad. The end. Uh, this slot's covered by the knight, so the king can go. Phew. All right. And this all, this all took like, uh, oh, good. I think it went a little slower, so it's it it actually possible to see what was going on. Um, uh,
written by one of the other people in the group. It was really neat. Um, and uh, very dramatic since we were like entering in the moves by hand. It was uh, like very like 1960s or something. All right. uh, so there's a couple more tricks that uh, chess playing programs use um, uh, to improve their play. It's funny, a lot of them boil down to gee, wouldn't it be great if we could look one move deeper? Let's just make our code run really, really fast. And then we can afford to look ahead an extra layer. So what can you do to run fast? Well, you can not write your program in JavaScript, for one thing. JavaScript is fantastic, but even as much as the speed has increased over the past couple of years, it still can't compete with uh, languages that compile directly to machine code statically. Um, another, uh, some, but, but like, you know, more interesting tricks you can use. Um, it turns out that there are 64 squares on a chessboard, and there are 64 bits in a machine word on your computer. So a lot of the basic operations that we do on a chessboard in the course of, say, computing what moves are available can just be bit shifts and logical ands and ors of 64-bit of, of, uh, of words. Um, and that turns out to just, like, save a ton of time. It makes things really fast. Um, what else can you do? Well, there's something I told you earlier that was a lie. Uh, and it turns out that chess AIs can, can take advantage of this um, uh, to, to, to be much faster and cover more ground. Yeah, I, like I made this slide thinking maybe they can see it. <laughs> but I think it's impossible. Maybe now, though. To see. Yes. So I said that it was a tree, right? But it's not. These two game states are the same, except this one's flipped upside down, which makes no difference to the rules of tic-tac-toe. They're effectively the same game. So if your program's smart, it'll compute some, a score for this move, and then when it gets here, it'll say, aha, I've seen this game state before, and use stored values instead of recomputing everything from scratch. Um, this is something good chess programs do. I haven't implemented it for, uh, for mine. So uh, I'm going to leave you with this URL. This is the URL to the Nash FP repository. It contains code in lots of different languages. There's no JavaScript yet, but you can be the first. Um, and Nash FP meets on the fourth Tuesday evening of every month. There's also uh, a separate repository, which I'll show you real quick, that has my JavaScript code in it. Um, this is the URL, and I guess I better close the console so you can see. All the JavaScripts that you saw today, including code to play pennies and tic-tac-toe against you, if you like losing games um, to a machine, <coughs> It's all just 300 lines of code, so you could actually like look at this and, and, and read it and understand it. And the code that we wrote together today, there it is right there. With minor variations, I guess. Well, that's all I got. Thanks very much. <laughs> Any questions before I turn it back over to Will? Did you, did you end up using a minimax instead of megamax when you did chess? They end up there. It's, it's the same algorithm. It computes the same thing, right? It's computing an optimal move. There's a, there's the, the commonly known algorithm is called minimax, and it's identical to megamax. You can look them both up on Wikipedia and see. Um, minimax has you writing like the same function twice, and you do a minimum in one and a maximum in the other. Um, and megamax, megamax is just like a little less code one more mental gymnastics thing you have to do. Very similar. OK, well, thanks again. Have fun.
Hey guys, uh, give it up one more time for all of our speakers tonight. They did a great job. Uh, yeah, uh, that's what we got tonight. Uh, feel free to hang out for a little bit. Um, probably going to try to head out by nine. Uh, so if you want to hang out till then, feel free. Um, Hello, hello.